Hey, Miss Lil. You looking good? You looking good? I like your green outfit better than your red one, but you look so pretty. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. I'm gonna show you my favorite graph. Life expectancy. So, really interesting thing, interesting paper came out this week and I have to put it in context. So, remember I've talked about this before, uh, lifespan for humans is about 28, 29 years for thousands of years until 1850 or so when science became integrated into medical care and there were some major advances, the discovery of germs, for example, germ theory, separating wastewater from drinking water, public health, antibiotics and vaccines, and then we made some advances with cardiovascular diseases, statins, and recently in cancer therapy. And there are only two times when it sort of went down. This was the Great Famine in China, uh, and then in the last year or so, COVID. So very interesting thing. So how do you know, though? How do you know these advances have made place? Well, there was, a, there was an interesting paper in JAMA Oncology where they used, these authors used the entire data set from the NCR, National Cancer Institute, and try to figure out how many deaths were prevented from our advances in cancer. And what they, what they came up with was nearly six million deaths were averted from 1975 onward from things like prevention and screening. So that's just a good example of why medical science does impact lifespan and actually saves lives. Just thought I'd throw that out there. It's a cool, cool paper. Uh, also, of course, we're never, we're never going to escape new diseases. There is another new disease that has been uh, described now in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in the Congo province. There have been 406 cases of an unknown disease that has fever, headache, runny nose, body aches, and they've had 31 deaths so far. Most of these are in children under the age of five, and since it's in a very remote uh, rural area, they don't really know what it is. But they're worried it might be, you know, some new form of uh, influenza or COVID or measles even. We're not sure what it is. But just in case you're wondering, this is the, the DRC, and that's the province, Congo province, uh, where they're seeing this. So a lot of investigators trying to figure out what that disease is. And, of course, I will keep you up to date as to if, uh, any discoveries. And we're dead in the middle. Why do I say dead? That's not good. We're right in the middle of the influenza season. Uh, three and a half percent increase in cases this past week. Uh, mostly it's H1N1 and H3N2, which is good news because that is what's in the vaccine. And as you can see, we're beginning to start that, that peak towards what we hope will be probably in December or January will peak. And as I mentioned, if you look at uh, the CDC data, it's all either uh, H1N1 or H3. So that's, that's good. Uh, interesting, if you follow the, the season, this blue line here is during COVID, and you can see we had almost no flu. And normally uh, in the past, uh, you know, these are other seasons, we are following this, this year tracking exactly what it looked like the, on the season before COVID, which I find interesting. So it looks like we're exactly having a season just like 2019 before, before COVID hit. And if you look at who is being affected the most, these are outpatient visits under the age of four and five to 24 year olds. And if you look at the 2024 season, it's interesting because it did peak. This is the peak um, from last year. It was right at week 52, 51, 52. So basically it's now. And it, it looks like we're tracking exactly the same. Uh, and I also have the data from TEFI, the sequencing data, also the same uh, variants that are in the flu vaccine anyway. So a lot of big news on the bird flu uh, front. Uh, very interesting. The United Kingdom is taking it very seriously. I, I think we are too, but I wish we were doing a little bit more. As I said before, I think we should be actually vac vaccinating cattle and all the workers that are exposed. Uh, but they ordered 5 million doses of vaccine to be ready because they're worried that there might be a pandemic. In, if you look at what's happened in the United States, we're up to 58 cases now. Uh, they're either, most of the cases are in California dairy uh, and then in the poultry industry. But California dairy, in the hot spots are California dairy industry and Washington, more poultry industry. So far, 10,600 wild birds, 114 million chickens now. 
uh, 720 dairy herds. And the USDA is uh, now getting a little bit more aggressive. They're making sure that all raw milk is being tested uh, because of the concern that it's, it's, in, it's in raw, raw milk. And there are a lot more warnings about not being sure you're not drinking raw milk because pasteurization gets rid of the, any viruses that are in there. Now, the um, one really the concern, remember we talked about that teenager <coughs> in Canada who was quite sick, and the concern is that, uh, from the sequence data, that he's actually got several different viral strains in him. Uh, and one of the sequences showed that it, there's a mutation that seems like it's more easily uh, in entering human cells. So, you know, it's fine to have the bird avian flu in wild birds, gets into people, we don't really support the, the, um, the disease very well, so those people have been largely mild cases. But this child has a very significant disease, teenager, had pneumonia, and sequencing his virus looks like there's a reason why it might have mutated uh, in him. Now the concern, of course, is if it ever mutates like more easily into human cells, but then also more easily transmittable, we'll have another pandemic on our hands. So that is why everyone is actually so concerned about it. And I'm concerned about it. Everybody should be concerned about it. So let's talk about RSV a little, because uh, it was missing for a while, but it's coming, it seems like it's coming back. If you look at the, uh, to me, the interesting thing is, I've mentioned this before, mostly it's a disease that happens in January, February, and March. But if you look at last year, 20, this was 2023, it was a much earlier season. So it, it sort of peaked in early November. Uh, and our, interestingly enough, no, it's beginning to show now in what RSV wastewater in the United States. You can see it's beginning to go up. So it's almost acting like we might have an earlier season for RSV infection. So if you haven't gotten your vaccine, please, please get your vaccine. And we're seeing it also in the TEFI data, the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute. What's, what's increased now is uh, uh, parainfluenza, RSV, and uh, parvovirus, and MPOX. But interestingly enough, we're seeing RSV earlier than we normally do. And as I mentioned before, if you look at who's most affected over the age of 75, over the last six years have been the people mostly hospitalized. So most of the mortality is in, in the elderly group, which is why you should get an RSV vaccine if you're over the age of 75. And actually, if you just have any comorbid condition, if you've got diabetes or hypertension and you're over the age of 60, you should also get an RSV vaccine. And that reminds me, Billy's over the age of 60. Do you have, did you get your RSV vaccine? Yes, I did. Okay, good. So you're here on the set, we take our recommendations <laughs> seriously. <laughs> and in news about Wuhan, <laughs> we forgot about Wuhan and COVID. Well, remember we were all blaming it on, on that one laboratory. Well, in Nature, they published a paper. They had a conference looking at all the different uh, viruses that were in the Wuhan Institute and none of them had any similarity to the virus that became the pandemic. So I, can't, I don't think we can blame it on Wuhan anymore. Although everyone wants to, I don't think we can. Uh, so far, not much is going on with COVID. Uh, it's down. Uh, I'll let you know what it seems to be emerging, but it's still pretty flat in wastewater. If you look at the variants, they're the same ones that have been before XEC, that one that came from Germany and Denmark. And, and then the KP3. So nothing new really to report on that. Uh, interestingly enough, if you look at the Travelers program, that's looking at airplanes and people coming into the, into the country, it's not the same. Uh, they, they don't have as much of the virus strains that we have, so I think a lot of this evolution has taken place in the U.S. These are older strains that, is, that we're seeing that, that are coming in. Anyway, uh, so mostly the interesting news is uh, around what's going on in the DRC, in the new emerging disease, uh, RSV a little earlier, uh, and COVID isn't really kicked out yet, and we're in the middle of the influenza season. So that's, that's a quick, quick summary of what I just told you. Anyway, I want to end today with some shout outs. First of all, a big shout out to our 83 graduates from the School of Health Professions who had their commencement last week. These uh, new healthcare professionals are entering the field of physician assistants, nurse anesthesia, orthotics, and prosthetics program, and are very important members of our uh, healthcare delivery team. When does genetics counseling? May. It's in May. We'll give them a shout out in May. Okay. Uh, and then again, to the National Academy of Veterans, congratulations to Dr. Malcolm Brenner and Cleona Rooney, 
where two of the 170 academic inventors named Fellows of the National Academy of Inventors. This is a, a highly uh, uh, important uh, award and designation of all the great stuff that they've done uh, in biomedical science. So congratulations to those two. And I want to say I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and have a wonderful weekend and I can't wait to see you next week.